Ruslan. Um, are you keeping up with some of the more mainstream critique, mainstream in terms of Christianity, of like um, uh, Rise and Fall of Mars Hill and some of that kind mm -hmm. of stuff? And, and what do you make of th that specifically, but just mainly the, the, the broader scope of how we've kind of created this celebrity Christian pastor culture uh, where people get elevated to platforms, they make mistakes, and then they're villains and it's, you know, it's, to me, it almost sounds, it, it reminds me of when the people wanted the king and they wanted Saul. And God's like, mm -hmm. ah, I don't think you want, you know, I got, no, we're here. No, 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 no. We need, we need, we need one. Then, He's going to force your kids to fight wars that you yeah. don't want them to fight in. You guys yeah. sure and you I want feel a king? Like, yeah. Yeah. And I feel like that's where we got to with, in terms of a lot of the mega church stuff and, you know. Uh, so anyway, what, do you, what are your thoughts on that? Are you keeping up with, with some of the, uh, the, the stuff coming out from Christianity today? And, and what do you make of that? Uh, yeah, I am keeping up with it more than I have in a long time. I, I used to be really intrigued by that. And all of this weirdly ties back into my journey of faith. I mean, for a long time, I felt like my superpower was my rightness so I could observe other people's wrongness and then find wittier more winsome, funnier, cutting ways to articulate what's wrong with the thing. Like I'm good at workshop and what's wrong with the thing and really getting to the heart. Mm -hmm. And that, that wore thin. I mean, I got a little tired of being that guy and that was kind of on the other side of my, my faith divide process. So back then I paid attention a lot so that I could imagine myself right and everybody else dumb. As I look at it now, I guess I'm in a little bit of a different place because well, now I'm one of those people, aren't I? not an important one, not a fancy one. I mm. mean, literally this is my basement. I mean, it's, I, those are bo real books and I do work at this desk. <laughs> That's but, not a set. Like, <laughs> nah, it, it's a basement, man. I mean, I got lights and stuff so you can see my face, but no, I, I, I work down here, but I'm just, I'm some guy. Yeah. And uh, at the same time, well, for whatever reason, nah, I don't know what to make of this. Still a lot of people watch, a lot of people yeah. listen every single day. I mean, that's, that flips the equation for me. So, so me, so you, we're people mm -hmm. who other people listen to. And so now all of a sudden, all of the Mars Hill podcast comes up and I'm, I'm caught up on that. Uh, CT writing articles now, which I find mm -hmm. to be a little bit ghoulish about every significant church that has a problem or mm -hmm. where elders mm -hmm. get crossways with each other. You know, here's a very important, hard hitting article to follow it up. And all of a sudden, even though I might disagree with the churches that are being critiqued, I'm also yeah. a little bit like, what are you guys doing? Yeah. Like, what's yeah. the upside here? Yep. It reminds me of when Tony Stark built a death robot that destroyed an entire city by flying it up into the sky and smashing it in Eastern Europe in whatever that was, Age of Ultron. And then in the next episode, he's so sad that to process through his guilt, he punishes all of his friends by making them... <laughs> sign documents and own culpability like nobody else made the death robot you idiot that was you <laughs> and i get that we all need to work through our guilt in some way but i feel like there's a little bit of that that has to be acknowledged yeah it's part of this deconstruction trend where people are like uh, yuck what was i a part of that felt a little culty that got a little weird and yeah. domineering and it, uh, it doesn't fit with the values that we have now but that's kind of yeah. what we thought in 2004 like kind of everybody it was pre-YouTube, pre-internet. And so what I'm hearing is Mike Cosper, who I think is very talented, and the people behind that show, I mean, there's some therapy going on. This is yeah. them working oh, yeah. through their sense of culpability yeah. and yeah. their ownership in it. It's cathartic to listen to. Yeah, and I and I don't begrudge them any of it. Yeah. But it's weird that somebody who I so have not resonated with over the years, Mark Driscoll, he's never been a sympathetic character to me. I don't I don't I'm, He's not a bad man. He's not. I have no judgment. I'm just acknowledging truthfully. I have not resonated with that approach or that style. And yet, I listen to this podcast and I feel, I feel empathy. Like, like mm. dude was taking a swing. It sounds like he kind of turned into a jerk. I've asked a lot more people to pray for me not to turn into more of a jerk than I already yeah. am. Uh, it <laughs> makes me really nervous. It makes me really sensitive as I listen to it. Yeah, but. I'm troubled by the fact that in all those articles that I'm reading about you know, this church is being dumb or those elders are mad at somebody else, there's a lot of hearsay and there's mm. no Bible. Mm. I, I haven't heard a word of biblical critique in eight episodes of the Mars Hill podcast of, of 
what's wrong with Mark Driscoll other than, I mean, he's just behaving in ways that they're citing through sources that were jerky and that are not in keeping with 2021 workplace best practice values. Now I care about 2021 workplace best practice values, Yeah, but it's, I, I mean, why is it wrong biblically? Why was what he was doing not in keeping with the authority of scripture or the text there? So it's weird to me that that just doesn't come up. Mm-hmm. Um, it's also weird to me in the article I just read about John Piper's church yep. that I, like there's a lot of people and that article is impenetrable, brother. I it's read long. through the whole thing and it's like, well, Daryl went to Applebee's with Connie and Connie saw him there, but Daryl didn't even say hi. So Connie knew he was mad. Then Connie went to the second pastor. Well, it's the second pastor's assistant and the elder who works with him and saw her wife, his wife. And then they got to talking and figured out that they didn't get the same story from the other guy. So they went to the other guy and they saw him at Chili's. No, that was also at Applebee's. Yeah. And then it's like, holy cow, that's not journalism. Like you, we look like idiots. And, and so I read that article and I come away maybe for the first time in my life understanding the don't do lawsuits among believers yes. text. It's like you just don't want to trot this out because you all look stupid. You, It's gossipy. It's ridiculous. Yeah. You do go out and get a margarita and tell that story to somebody who's super empathetic at Chili's or Applebee's. But it does not play well as journalism. Like they got a problem. They got different visions. They don't know yeah. what to do with CRT and and some of the new, more fundamentalist elements of the extreme far end of the distribution culturally. Yeah. Guess what? Nobody knows what to do with it. Yeah. Everybody feels this sense of, well, of course we want justice. Also, mm, there are things mixed in with that, that that those are tested ideas and those don't work. There's a right. little bit of bad idea and murderous ideology mixed in with really good ideas and things that are yeah. fair and right and just. Yeah. Yeah. And so people feel tension. They feel internally conflicted. They're going to feel yeah. conflicted within the church. It should be no surprise that a church that has a conscience is going to feel conflicted about something that is demonstrably a mixed bag. Yes. They're not going to have unity in how to proceed. And it just feels a little bit ghoulish and grave robberish to me to lick the chops and quickly run right over there and be like, oh, tell me everything, Brenda. Oh, is yeah. that so, Kyle? Well, yeah, we'll we'll handle that discreetly. Like, I don't, I just don't need it. It feels like a little vulture circling. I don't understand how that makes things better, but it feels like there is this reckoning happening. Mm. Some of which is fair. Some of which is misguided where all of us are coming to grips with the reality that the Christianity we were raised with didn't win. It didn't win in the way we thought winning happened. The age of the internet happened and all the churches who were doing well before Mm -hmm. quit doing well. My credentialing is with the Evangelical Free Church. I got two degrees from their institutions. I've worked in those kind of churches forever. Mm-hmm. It, was the, it was the best thing going in evangelicalism until exactly the year YouTube happened and the curves just flip. YouTube goes up, EFCA becomes more listless. It's, it's just struggled. It, it knew what to do before that. It doesn't know what to do in the age of the internet quite as well. And you know what? Nobody knows what to do in the age mm. of the internet. We haven't mm. cracked the nut yet. We don't, we don't know how to be. We don't know how to say the gospel to the internet era. It, it's mingled up with politics, some of which makes sense, some of which doesn't. Yeah. There's other things boiling to the surface, past abuses and wrongs that we want to do right by, but also at some point we'd like to look to the future and and do new things and move forward and so this paralysis is what i'm seeing everywhere and again to your question what i see in the mars hill podcast is some kind of therapeutic reckoning let's try to make sense of whatever this thing was that a lot of us got behind yeah sort of processing but if the rise and fall of mars hill is our end game we're doomed that Mm. can't be where christianity is headed Yes. If that's a little stop off point, a little depot that we needed yep. to check in to clear our heads before we do the next thing, fine. We like I just told you the story of me having to clear my head. Yeah. Yeah. And my faith straight up breaking. I can be patient with other people who need to have a reckoning with their stuff as well. But at some point, like, what's the plan here? Yeah. I think yeah. at some point the goal of the church is to go and proclaim the gospel and make disciples of all nations. I think at some point Come what on. we do here is we take this beautiful thing that are the values of the kingdom, we put it in front of whatever version of brokenness the world is while we're on the stage, and what do you know? It's transformative. So right now, the new uh, fundamentalism that exists 
one of the key tenets is no forgiveness ever. You mm. violate the new orthodoxy, you're going to suffer. Well, guess what? That's going to get old because it'll burn everybody. <laughs> guess what we have? Forgiveness for complete screw-ups like me. Yeah. Forgiveness for people who hurt people and do stupid stuff. Forgiveness for Mark Driscoll for being a jerk. Yeah. Forgiveness for people who did awful things. And yeah, there might be some accountability. You might have to square accounts. That might hurt. Yeah. But there is forgiveness in Christ. And that's the thing that we need to be repositioning to be able to say to a world that really quickly here is going to get tired of the new fundamentalism they're inventing because we yeah. got tired of it because it's unsustainable. There's no yep. grace. There's no life in it. And we're months. Maybe yep. we're already there. Maybe we're a year. Maybe we're two years away from a place where a clear kingdom Christian gospel message of there is life, there is forgiveness, no one is irredeemable, there is yeah. justice in this thing. Yeah. Like, come, the, the burden that you're carrying is heavy. The burden of Christ is light. Take this on and see, taste of the life that is in it. Right now, we are not positioned to do that because of division in the church, yep. because we don't know what to do with the internet, because we're still reckoning with our own demons and our own past. Yeah. But I think we're close. So when I see the podcast you referenced, when I see the kind of articles that I'm seeing, my feeling is, okay, if it's for a minute or two. Yeah, yeah. But at some point, we have to go do the thing that we do, that we exist to do. We can't take that off for one or two generations or nobody will remember it. And so, yeah. so we kind of have a job with our little moment on the stage here, brother. Kingstream Entertainment. Bruce Lawn. When the culture says do what you love, we respond with love what you do. You may have responsibilities that you aren't passionate about, but loving what you do means being faithful to what's in front of you, committing to excellence as if that were your greatest dream. Colossians 3.23 says, work diligently at whatever you do as though you were working for the Lord rather than for people. Love what you do. Love what you do. do, do. Kingstream Entertainment. Bruce Lawn. Yo, thank you so much for making it to the end of this video. If you found it valuable, considering giving it a like and subscribing. This month, I'm releasing the Love What You Do collection. And to celebrate, I'm doing a three-day virtual event to help us go from learning to love what we do to ultimately doing what we love. By the way, it's free, so hit the link in the description to grab your seat today.